Recently, we've been learning all about ionic compounds. We've learned that in an ionic compound, an electron is transferred from one atom to another, and that the difference in charge holds them together. In this lesson, we turn to covalent compounds. These are held together by covalent bonds, fittingly enough. And in covalent bonds, electrons are actually shared between the atoms, and that's what holds them together. Let's first review how we identify ionic compounds, then we'll learn how to identify covalent compounds and how those bonds work. Let's take a look. Remember that whenever we combine a metal and a non-metal, we get an ionic compound. And then we can use our periodic table to tell the difference. The non-metals are over here on the right, and the metals are on the left. So if you mix together something from the right and left-hand side, then you get an ionic compound. If you put together two metals, so take just those elements circled in green, we get just a metallic solid or an alloy. We won't talk about the properties of these compounds in detail in this class, but I thought it would be nice for you to know that that makes something as well. Okay, but what happens when we put together two nonmetals? When we put together two nonmetals, we get what's called a covalent compound. And that's the other category of compound that we're gonna study in detail in this class. So basically what that means, if we grab two things from over here on the right-hand side of the periodic table, we'll get a covalent compound. They turn out to have different properties than the ionic compounds and their bonds work differently. If I look at the smallest element on the periodic table, it's hydrogen. And it's the only element that should really go way over here to be grouped with all of its other non-metal friends. But it is the smallest atom, and because it's a nonmetal, if we put two of them together, we actually get the simplest molecule. So here, let's consider what happens when we have two hydrogen atoms. Here, I've drawn a representation of a hydrogen molecule, and this line here is one way we represent a covalent bond. So that just is one way to represent a covalent bond. Now, what does that actually mean, though? Let's draw two hydrogen atoms and think about it. Well, the hydrogen atoms have just one thing in the nucleus, one proton. So here's one of our hydrogen atoms, and it has one proton. And then, let's say it comes alongside another hydrogen atom, just like we have represented above. That's another proton. Now, each of those protons came with a single electron. And so if we imagine the electrons, where are they going to want to hang out? Remember, our electrons could hang out here, or here, or here, or here. They're going to want to hang out in the center between the two positively charged protons because they're going to be attracted to both of those protons, and it'll be the most stable for them to hang out in the middle. So let's draw where those electrons will typically hang out. Those electrons will typically hang out, like I said, right in the middle. So there's one, two electrons, one from each hydrogen atom, that hold together these two hydrogen atoms in a covalent bond. So we have the two atoms stuck together, and the reason they're stuck together is because the protons are positive, and so the protons are attracted to these electrons, and the electrons are negative, and so they're actually attracted to both of these protons. And so this holds the whole atom together in one molecule. That's what a covalent bond is. In a covalent bond, the electrons are shared. They hang out in between the two nuclei, and they're shared. Now, in hydrogen, all the electrons in the atom are shared. But most of the time when you have a covalent bond, just some of them are shared. In fact, every single time you see a line like this, that represents two electrons. Two electrons that are shared. So a covalent bond is the sharing of two electrons in a molecule. Let's now think about some of the properties that covalent mo molecules have. Well, first, they have low melting points. And this is particularly in contrast to ionic compounds. We've actually already taken a look at this table where we saw that sodium chloride, which is ionic, has a melting point of 800 degrees Celsius. Barium nitrate, another ionic compound, has a melting point of 1100 degrees Celsius, so very high melting points. Meanwhile, water, which is a covalent compound, melts at zero degrees Celsius, and sugar, which is a covalent compound, melts at 160 degrees Celsius. So what we see here is that the covalent compounds tend to have much lower 
melting points. The reason that is, is remember that in our ionic compounds, we have to actually overcome that full attraction between the negatively charged ion, say on chlorine, and the positively charged ion on sodium. Whereas in our other covalent compounds, we simply have to overcome something called intermolecular forces, which are much weaker. So it's much easier to melt water than it is to melt salt. And that goes well with our everyday experience, where we can easily melt water, but who of us have seen sodium chloride, table salt, be melted? Another important property of covalent compounds is that they're not conductive. The reason they're not conductive is because there's no charges that move around. Remember, the electrons are shared equally, and so that means that neither of those elements is going to be charged, and if there's no charges, there can be no electric current. That stands in contrast to our ionic compounds, which had charges, and if you melted them, then they could move, and that would conduct electricity. We see an example here of us taking advantage of the insulating properties of covalent compounds. These wires that are plugged into all these terminals are made of covalent compounds. So we make insulating plastic from covalent compounds to keep charges from moving between wires, right? We don't want any of this jumble of wires to be connected to each other and allow a current to go from one thing to another where it's not supposed to. And so when we want to conduct a current, we use metals or we could use molten ionic compounds. But when we want to stop things from conducting, we use covalent compounds like plastics. Okay, now let's practice identifying compounds as covalent or ionic. All right, first we have sodium chloride. Okay, NaCl. Let's look at what sodium is. Sodium comes from right here on the periodic table. Notice it's in that light yellow color and it's on the left-hand side. So that makes sodium a metal. Meanwhile, when we look at chlorine, chlorine is way over on the right. It's element number 17. And it's in that light blue color or light green color and that makes it a non-metal. So we have a metal and a non-metal. And remember, whenever we have a metal combining with a non-metal, that gives us an ionic compound. So that's ionic. All right, the next compound, sodium sulfide, has sodium, which again we already saw was a metal, and has sulfur, which if we look on the periodic table, we'll find it as element number 16, way over there in the non-metal category. And so when we combine together a metal and a nonmetal, once again, we get an ionic compound. CO2. Notice carbon comes from the right-hand side of the periodic table over here, and so does oxygen. So those are both nonmetals. It's a nonmetal and a nonmetal. And since there's two nonmetals, what that tells us is that this is a covalent compound. That means the electrons in the oxygen and carbon are shared between each other to form a covalent bond. That means that it would tend to have a low melting point, that it wouldn't conduct electricity. So being able to identify what compound is what really helps us understand what properties these compounds might have. Okay, lastly, we see lithium fluoride. Lithium, Li, is found way over on the left side of the periodic table. It's element number three, and it's yellow. It's one of those metals. Meanwhile, fluorine over on the right-hand side, element number nine, and it is a nonmetal. So once again, we combined a metal and a nonmetal, and that would give us an ionic compound. Okay, let's answer one more question about these compounds now. Which of the following compounds would you expect to have the lowest melting point? Well, remember, we said that covalent compounds tend to have low melting points. And since A, B, and D are all ionic, that means we would expect them to have high melting points, and we would expect C, carbon dioxide to have a low melting point. All right, so covalent compounds tend to have low melting points and tend to not be conductive. Let's review. Electrons are shared in covalent bonds. That's different than ionic bonds where electrons are transferred from one atom to another and then the difference in charge holds them together. The shared electrons holds covalent compounds together. We can recognize covalent compounds by remembering that they're made of two or more nonmetals, and they typically have low melting points and do not conduct electricity. Hey, hey.